Hello and welcome to the Lizelle Wellbeing Show. I'm Lizelle, this is Basil, and I'm speaking here with the leading experts and fascinating folk from the world of wellbeing to bring you wellness wisdom you can trust. And this week, we are delving back into the world of gut health with the creative scientist, otherwise known as Miguel Toribio Mateus. Now, Miguel is a nutritionist, a clinical neuroscientist and disco DJ. Yeah, you heard that right. And it's all actually part of an important bit of his work. He specializes in the microbiome and the gut brain connection. And we've had a great chat about how and why the brain and the gut are so intimately connected and the influence this has on our mood and our all important immunity. What's so empowering about gut health, Miguel says, is that we can all make a huge difference to our health simply by making small tweaks to the food we put on our plates, including drinking kombucha and kefir. Yes. As always, I really do look forward to hearing your thoughts on Instagram after the show. And don't forget, if you would like to watch Miguel and I, you can now find full video podcasts over on the Lizelle Wellbeing YouTube channel. So let's join Miguel now for a true Truly fascinating chat. So, Miguel, I am so thrilled that you are joining me virtually. Whereabouts are you? Um, not far from London in Hertfordshire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when we uh, just when we were chatting just before we went live, I was playing one of your house music disco compilation tracks. Honestly, your website is my new favourite thing. How did, <laughs> how did all that happen? Guts, brains, and disco. <laughs> Well, it's been a bit of a journey to um, blend all of those things together because they have been in my life for a while. Uh, probably disco for the longest because I grew up. Um, I'm I'm born in '73, so I'm a late disco kind of a uh, uh, teen. I was fascinated with disco through my teens and people thought it was a bit weird because it was the 80s and nobody was interested in disco so I was being a bit of a weirdo in my teens growing growing up to Donna Summer and uh, and all this kind of stuff and in which country I was I grew up in in Spain so I grew up in Madrid my mom and dad are from the south of Spain and I grew up in Madrid and uh, came to the UK when I was 21 uh, to study and uh, I never left, so I've been here from '94. Brilliant. So, and were you studying neuroscience back then, from the beginning? No, I uh, I've gone around the houses a little bit. I uh, I did my first degree in business and languages, and then I did environmental science, and that got my interest picked in in sustainability and and food production and and things like that. And at the same time, I was training to be a yoga teacher in my parallel life. Uh, and uh, and I did the yoga training with the British Wheel of Yoga. That was almost like doing a degree because it was actually very hard. And um, and that got me more uh, even into the therapeutic use of uh, herbs and spices. You know the Ayurvedic kind of tradition and how these people who were coming to lecture um, were talking about how you could make different spices to. To have different effects on the body to increase heat on the body or to reduce heat on the body and talking about heat and inflammation and all this kind of stuff and and i was thinking this is very interesting i need to go back and and study it properly so i went to university to study nutrition or nutritional medicine so i did a um a degree uh, in nutritional medicine and, and and then i went to the neuroscience um a pathway so i did nutrition before neuroscience and when i did neuroscience I started realizing how a lot of the language was already in my vocabulary because even though clinical neuroscience, there's a lot on drugs and and treatments, Mm -hmm. a lot of the mechanisms are actually influenced by nutrients. And this is the beauty, the combination of the of the nutrients and, and the brain. So the brain is kind of like the later addition. The gut was there for a longer time because I was looking at gut health from probably the mid notice and this co has been there for a long while. So I thought, why not just blend them all together? And instead of actually having separate lives, just bring them all into one. And that's me. That's Miguel 2020. You are, are great because you just make it so much more fun and accessible. And obviously I'm a relative newcomer to, to gut health. I wrote a book called The Good Gut Guide about four years ago. 
and have become increasingly fascinated by the microbiome. And of course, one of the things that we hear a lot about is this gut-brain axis and how mm -hmm. the gut is linked to the brain. Can you talk us through that and the vagus nerve and how all those pathways are connect? Sure. So the gut is very interesting because even though it's inside the body, it's almost like the first port of call for um, a lot of stuff that's going on around us. So it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's almost like immigration at Gatwick or something. You need to show your passport and then show who you are to to come into into the body, into the, the can into a different country. I'm never going to be able to go to the airport again. I'm going to call it <laughs> Gatwick and not Gatwick. <laughs> <laughs> that's it that's it that's a re really good analogy so it's um and 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 it's it's a communication system as well as an interface between different systems in the body so it's like a melting pot so your food is going in there but uh um you're not just using the gut as a digesting apparatus in a way you're using it as a as an interface between that inside of the body uh, that is also communicating with the outside and the immune system, which is largely based in, in the blood and the lymph. But in that interface between the gut and the blood, largely the mucus layer, so the, the mucousy part of the gut that is protecting the, the actual gut lining, the one cell wall that you have separating the gut and, and the rest of the body. Is it just one cell? That's where Wow, that's there's just one cell yeah there's it this the loads of tissues have got layers like your skin has got layers of cells um obviously tissues that are more three-dimensional when you imagine them like the liver and the kidneys you know there's layers upon layers of different kidney cells uh liver cells and so on in different parts of those organs but in the in the gut lining there's just one layer of cells which is very interesting because it's serving a lot of purposes so there's a uh, um, a little bit of um, immunity involved in there. There's a, a lot of communication because it's receiving messages from from nutrients. It's receiving messages from molecules that your gut bacteria are releasing as they are chomping up fiber that you're putting in your body and um, polyphenols, it's antioxidants and so on, colors. So when we talk about eating the rainbow, they are eating that rainbow and and producing those molecules. And uh, and they're talking, those molecules, those nutrients are actually talking to the rest of the body. And and that layer is, is very thin, but very important because 70 to 80% of your immunity in the whole of your body is actually based there. So when we talk about gut as being one of the central points of the body, it's become a bit, a bit of a cliche and that trivializes that a little bit because people think, oh, there's so many different approaches. And of course, I agree, there are many approaches, but because the body is so complex, you need to enter that system that is very, uh, you know, is made up of, of, of hundreds, hundreds of different pieces. You need to enter uh, somewhere and start um, making changes. And the gut is perfect because there's so much going on. So even a tiny change, as you will have written about in your book, a tiny change can have a massive effect. It's this kind of a uh, quantum physics kind of a butterfly effect that even a tiny amount of fiber more every day can have a disproportionately beneficial effect in a person. How extraordinary. I remember seeing a letter published, it was an open letter, signed by literally hundreds of medics working in the field of gut health and, and, and microbiome, uh, sent to the government back in, I think it was June, saying, please, can we be looking more at gut health and microbiome? health to help with COVID and increased immunity, because clearly these researchers all know that it's a fundamental part of keeping us well. Absolutely. And it's it's all down to that to the, in, to that to the integrity of not so much that layer of cells that of course, you know, th there could be some physical problems with it. It's the mucus layer that is um, surrounding it. And in that mucus layer, which is a little bit like a, a, a little bit harder consistency than an aloe vera gel. So if people know about aloe vera gel, you know, in this kind of like nice serums that you can get for skin and so on, it's a little bit harder than that, uh, uh, but it's still quite jelly-like. And that enables some bacteria to, um, to live inside that layer 
and to feed from that layer as a mechanism to not only stay alive themselves, but to communicate with the rest of the body uh, by producing bits and pieces that I'm sure we're going to talk about um, in a moment. And those bits and pieces are a little bit like the Wi-Fi signals in a, an internet connection. So there is a cable, that vagus nerve that you mentioned uh, a moment ago that connects the gut uh, as well as the adrenal glands and, you know, it innervates, it's, it's like a mesh of cables that then solidifies into just one thick cable that goes straight into the brain and not only into the brain, but into the emotional part of the brain, the, the limbic system, which is the area of the brain regulating fear, stress, anxiety, and so on. So when you're talking about COVID and the lack of security that we all feel because things are wobbly every day, they are different. We don't know whether we can travel, whether we're gonna have a job tomorrow, all of those things, when we talk about gut feelings, we're getting a lot more of those gut feelings and they are being sent to to the brain as a, almost like fiber to your house. You know, the new fiber to your house that you get that are like gigabyte fibers, you know, super download speeds. <laughs> they are being sent all the way to your brain very, very fast. And, uh, and the brain needs to make sense of all of those things. And at the moment, there's a lot of that going on. And at the same time, it needs to digest your food and it needs to nourish different layers of the gut, including those cells in the gut lining. So there's a lot going on at the moment that can go wrong, but equally, if you have some basics in place, you can, you can put yourself in the best position you can at, uh, at, the, at the point of protecting yourself from COVID. But never more important than now, really, to be focusing on, yeah. on gut health. And how quickly can we see changes? You know, if, if we start to eat perhaps more probiotic foods, we have more fiber in our diet, we start drinking kefir or kombucha, you know, how quickly can we see a difference in how we feel in our brain? That's a, a very interesting question. So back in 2013, 14, there was already evidence, uh, pretty good um, evidence, looking at how even in a couple of days but certainly in four days there could be massive changes just from increasing the amount of fiber that somebody had in their diet and uh, that was based in a study that was run on comparing somebody who was eating meat with uh, somebody who was introducing more plant-based foods now that can be misinterpreted in the sense that oh it's best to just have a plant-based food and to exclude all animal produce it, it wasn't like that that wasn't the aim of the study it was just introducing more plant diversity now there's been a, a series of continuations to that study from different um, uh, teams of researchers around the world but there was one that um, I've been looking at uh, recently just uh, published in um, um, cell um, as part of the nature groups are really reputable um, a journal it's like getting a paper in there it's like getting into Fort Knox it's very uh, you only need to you only publish in that journal if you if your research is very very sound and he's looking at he's taking it next level so he's taking it to the point that if you take a sample of uh, your stool for 30 days every day every day there will be changes according to what you have eaten the night before and not only that if you and I go on that trial and we provide those samples, even if we are fed the same foods, the changes will be different for you and for me because our microbiome um, baselines are different. So there will be a point where uh, the berries or the bananas or the blueberries or whatever you're eating that was new or the kombucha and the kefir that you mentioned will bring you to a kind of a similar baseline um and then you need to change so the changes occur very very quickly and it doesn't take long for people to benefit from these foods so uh, at the same time if you want to derive long lasting benefit you need to keep them going as well so you cannot just drink one bottle of kombucha one day a month and then ex expect that your whole health is going to be hunky-dory the next day you want to keep watering your garden yeah 
So is it really about having this diverse range so that we get lots of different things? Because it, I was it, one of the things that struck me there talking about that bit of research is that you say that they were providing stool samples every day for 30 days. Now we're hearing a lot about these home testing kits, which is just a snapshot. It's providing one sample and sending it off. I mean, what's the point of that? Absolutely, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, um, um, I've been in that field and um, my whole um, doctoral work for the last six years largely has been in, in that area. Um, I um, I was looking at this kind of stuff with Professor Tim Spector, who's become the mega celebrity of COVID and everything else is everywhere. He's the, he's the Lady Gaga of science, uh, Tim. I love him. He's absolutely everywhere. Impossible not to see him in any channel that talks about science. I love him dearly and I respect his work a lot. And we did some work together Back in the day where poo testing was still a little bit, uh, um, you know, taboo and people were thinking about it in a almost alternative kind of way. And, and science has come up a long way now to the point that, yes, uh, that argument that a snapshot is a snapshot is still valid. But there are now platforms that allow you to compare your results from one day to the next. And obviously, I wouldn't advise you, Liz, to send a sample daily for 30 days unless you really wanted to do it because you know it will be interesting but you know what is the point yes. um for a study yes to try and prove a hypothesis but you at home probably would only need to do this um, i don't know three to six months maybe a couple of times a year if you really were working on your gut so if you are just a happy go lucky eating whatever suits you and you're very attuned to how your body is responding to your to those changes absolutely fine if you want to use this information as a motivational tool to to make changes to your diet and your lifestyle because they go hand in hand as well normally people who buy kombucha they don't just eat uh fried foods all day long they it, you know they, they make a, a decision to buy that kombucha or that kefir as part of a larger um, um, shift in, in, in how they look at their diet. But if you were to do this a couple of times a year, at least you can see that certainly um, some types of bacteria like lactobacilli, bifidobacteria, but also some other bugs that are interesting and, and they are involved in your immunity as well as your metabolism, like Ackermansia mucinifila is, is very spoken about. It's become trendy as the... Well, that's the one that's going to keep us thin, isn't it? Okay. Yes. It's a skinny bug that people talk about it as a skinny bug. The only thing is that people try to put it in a capsule. There's been clinical trials, so um, so uh, uh, researchers have tried to argument that, okay, because it's thin in people who tend to be naturally skinny, whatever they eat, and they never put on weight. So that kind of individual has uh, been seen to have more acromantia than other types of people. Let's put some in a capsule, which is incredibly difficult because the moment that you expose acromantia to oxygen, it dies. But let's put it into a capsule and uh, and give it to participants in a, in a trial and see if they lose weight. And what they found was that they didn't lose a particular amount of weight compared to uh, the control. So people who took just the sugar pill didn't, uh, you know, the, the weight um, at loss difference was not significant. But what happened in those who took the acromantia was that things to do with their metabolism, like their ability to regulate blood sugar more uh, effectively, um, triglycerides or cholesterol levels were a bit better in those who took the the, um, the mm -hmm. probiotic. So it's still in early development. And again, it's it's not, it, there's never a silver bullet to this kind of stuff. But if you wanted to know what those bugs are actually doing inside your own gut without having to take something external, um, it's very interesting to just take out, out argument a couple of times a year, you track progress. And at that point, if you're able to see in a graph, this is what is happening when I'm doing this. So I can relate to that because I was eating more lettuce taste during that month or so I went vegan in veganuary and look at what happened in February compared to what happened six months before. Certainly if there are changes like that that you're going to you you know you're going to plan for like that veganuary or going alcohol free for a, a couple of months or things like that. I think it would be very interesting for people to do a before and after to see if that 
if they have an interest in, in gut health and they have a, a motivation as well because they are bloated or, you know, they have issues digesting certain foods. So anything along the lines of that, that would be very useful. And again, it, it's for me, it's based about around the the application of that information in the real world. What do you do with it? And if I agree, if it is just the one snapshot, it's, it's interesting, but it's pretty much useless two months later. If you have another point of data a few months later and a few months later and a few months later, that becomes more like a tracker of what your body's doing. And I'm not suggesting that people become obsessive with this kind of stuff because your gut bacteria are very temperamental and they will go up and down in their own kind of ways. But at least you can start to understand them a little bit better. You talk about bloating. Is there a particular species that's helpful for that or, or food types that can help? It depends on a lot of that. It changes a lot according to the person. So some people can eat these foods that are rich in fermentable um, fibers um, known as FODMAPs. And they can be absolutely fine. Some people can only tolerate a little bit. So there's a lot of um, uh, difference amongst people. Um, and I'm not one for trying to exclude things on the basis that you might be bloated. So uh, if you're bloated and you can uh, identify a trigger point that is definitely the culprit for you, I would argue, okay, try and reduce that if you can, uh, as opposed to just give a general kind of uh, advice because it's a bit dangerous for people to start reducing things willy-nilly. Absolutely. I mean, keeping a food diary, just keeping track of how you feel after eating certain foods is, is probably one of the best ways, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, yeah. You talk about emotions and the gut. You talk about, you know, gut instinct and, and gut feelings. How real is it? Where is the evidence that, that what we eat can change how we feel? Well, this a lot of evidence on the emotional neuroscience, um, a branch of, of brain sciences uh, on the basis that the those Wi-Fi signals that we talked about before, so the communication between the gut and the brain largely happens via the vagus nerve as a cable a kind of a solution. So you've got your you know, your phone with a cable, that is the, the vagus nerve kind of thing. Or you could have it that only on Wi-Fi, no cable. So those Wi-Fi signals could be a range of uh, different things. And uh, the ones that you can think of more specifically when you talk about brain are neurotransmitters. So people talk about serotonin, dopamine, GABA to a certain extent, but serotonin and dopamine have become quite mainstream. People talk about them more readily than maybe 10 years ago. And they are responsible of, um, they're responsible for an, a lot of things, but they play a role in emotion as well. And uh, serotonin is supposed to make you feel happy. It's supposed to be the happy neurotransmitter. So if you have the ability to produce enough serotonin, for that serotonin to stay between one cell and another, so in that synapse, in that space between a neuron and another, and then to be taken by the next neuron next to the to the one that originated that that serotonin, which is which is called reuptake. So it's basically serotonin floating from one cell to another in the brain. If that process works properly, then you have less chances of feeling down, depressed, mm. anxious, all of that spectrum from anxiety to really major um, um, clinical depression. Mm -hmm. And everybody can be in, in different, different places of that spectrum at different times. So we all have uh, days that we might feel a bit more anxious. It doesn't mean that we suffer from clinical anxiety. Some days we're going to be low because things didn't turn out to be the way we wanted them to be. It's life. Uh, but certainly, to build those neurotransmitters, so to build that serotonin, for example, you need carbohydrates. So the building blocks will be things that you put in your mouth. And carbs uh, are a little bit like, you know, uh, um, um, they are not all the same. So people talk about carbs and they tend to be obsessive with potatoes and rice and bread. 
and you have carbs in a bit of lettuce as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they come uh, at the same time, they come in a matrix of uh, food that is not just a, an extract or a supplement. It's not a powder. That food that you're eating has got the cofactor, sometimes B vitamins or zinc or selenium or whatever it is that's going to enable the, the building blocks of that food to be broken down effectively and used by the body in an effective manner. Now, that's very important for neurotransmitter production because there will be serotonin that is produced in the gut, that stays in the gut largely because it serves some purpose in the gut. Largely, it's about peristalsis. So it's about how your gut moves so you can have a nice bowel motion in the morning. And if serotonin is not quite produced properly in your, in your gut, or there's a certain lack that could actually have an impact. And same thing with dopamine as well. So serotonin and dopamine play a role in how the muscle will actually relax to allow you to have a proper, you know, visit to the, to the toilet in the morning. And, a way of self-diagnosis then if, if you're suffering from constipation or you have issues in that area is that an indication that you might be low in dopamine and serotonin it is tricky because it's not as easy as that i would love it for it to be as easy as that but it's it's tricky but what you could what you see is in certain end states so uh, when you're talking about conditions that, that sound a bit scary but they are the the end state of how a neurotransmitter can actually go wrong when there is a complete lack of dopamine like in parkinson's for example there's a dysregulation dopamine is not working properly in parkinson's mm -hmm. and you have that that as an end state uh, constipation is one of the symptoms so in in a person with parkinson's who is developing uh, a more severe set of symptoms finding it more difficult to go to the toilet is one of the things that a clinician will probably think okay things you know we probably need to adjust the medication so for the regular fork out there, I wouldn't worry so much if you haven't gone to the loo today because it could have been just random. So I don't think that you're going to develop Parkinson's because you have been constipated for a couple of days. Yeah. But interestingly, you know, people do say that when they start taking probiotic supplements, for example, or more probiotic rich foods, that bowel movements improve. And is that potentially one of the reasons that we're actually creating more serotonin and dopamine? Um, certainly serotonin and dopamine can be uh, 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 those levels in uh, levels of those neurotransmitters in the gut can be affected by uh, by different um, um, uh, bacteria in fermented foods. Um, a lot of that serotonin is not going to ever reach the brain because it won't the, it'll be blocked by this thing called the blood brain barrier. So it's a, it's a different um structure so it doesn't quite open the lock so it's almost you know it's a key but and you think oh all keys look the same you should open my house but it doesn't open your house it opens you know somebody else's house so it's you know unless you have the proper key you cannot get into the brain and uh, and with some neurotransmitters that are produced in the gut that can be very much the case histamine potentially not so much and that again histamine has got this bad um, um, kind of uh, uh, perception by people because you immediately think of itching or reactions or allergies. But again, is also involved in emotion, is involved in wakefulness, in energy. So if you are falling asleep during the day, that could be because histamine is not communicating the message that is communicating, which is stay awake. Uh, is one of the messages that histamine is communicating uh, to the brain in certain parts of the brain. And in fact, again, looking at another condition, uh, narcolepsy, it's histamine is not communicating that message at all. So the person falls asleep in the middle of the day. So the drugs that are there to um, stop that person falling asleep as a clinical treatment actually stimulate the production of histamine in the brain. So all these things are complex how they work and they don't do just one thing so while it's i'm all up for plain english i love cute analogies and but when they are two simplex systems sometimes you you miss one of the areas that you could be exploring in a little bit more detail
very interesting that you bring up the subject of histamine because that's something that we've been exploring here quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And my eldest daughter, who's had real issues with chronic pain for many years, has an imbalance of histamine and uh, and its relationship with mast cells as as part mm -hmm. of the system. So actually, she at the moment needs to be very low histamine. Um, but obviously there are implications of that. And it's, it's interesting, isn't it, how we're just beginning to understand how some of our biochemistry is actually working. And it all comes back to the gut. This is the extraordinary thing. Yeah, the gut is there. It's kind of in the middle. It's almost like trying to cross from Regent Street to um, Oxford Street and not wanting to go into the, into the junction. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you need to go into the into that roundabout if you're driving through you cannot just uh, go around the houses you you need to go in, in there to to turn into another system it's connected with every single system in the body and and going back to your question about emotions emotions are complex because they are not just biochemical um this whole theory is around how emotions are driven by biochemical molecules and there's a lot of science on that but they are about behavior and cues and where you are and who you do something with and all of these things that they play a really big role in how you develop an emotion. Mm. Um, so this, it, there are multifaceted things that are quite complicated, but certainly you, you'll know there are basic things that you can identify. If you are in a situation, imagine yourself um, having a walk down the beach and uh, it's sunny and uh, it's the summer and you have an ice cream and you have a you know you have a sugar rush and that is serotonin being produced really quickly uh, in your body uh, and, and and giving you access to sugar in a, even in a more effective way so the the glycemic in, impact of that ice cream is even better and it's almost like an, an instant antidepressant you know but Again, is it just the ice cream or is it the situation that you're in as well? And what role is that playing? Is it the sun? Is it the company? Is it just the ice cream? So there's loads of different kind of angles to this. So interesting. Can we talk a little about psychobiotics? Because these are things that we're hearing more and more about. We've we learned a little bit about prebiotics and probiotics. What are the psychobiotics? So psychobiotics are really interesting as well because they are um, the bugs that you can uh well you can supplement the idea is that this has largely this term has come from cryon and dynan in cork uh, uh, there are two researchers in dynan is a ted dynan is a psychiatrist and uh, uh john cryon at the university of uh, um, cork they are in this massive research group that i admire because they are incredible at the research that that they produce on the gut brain axis and the psychobiotic term may have been used by somebody randomly in the past but they largely started publishing in this area and it describes a, a bug that has got the ability to change your psyche your emotions uh your cognition anything to do with that those kind of uh, aspects of, of of brain function and um uh, you can supplement some of these bugs that's the theories that they have been exploring with certain certain bugs and certain bugs have actually been seen to have a uh, some kind of um, uh, effect on 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 the brain so certainly there are um, uh, lact certain types of lactobacilli certain types of bifidobacteria but when you start looking at the studies and how big they are and how clear the impact is versus an antidepressant for example or taking into account a whole bunch of other things known as confounding factors like for example when we go back to that um walking down the beach eating the ice cream what is making you happy is it the ice cream or the fact that you're in this beautiful beach with some lovely company and the sun is shining so how do you attribute the effect to one thing or another? So psychobiotics are very interesting because the idea is that you could uh, potentially um, complement the work of uh, antidepressants. So you can reduce the dose and take those with a probiotic and make that work better. And there's some science on that already that is quite promising. Or, uh, you know, if you take it again to the next level, you could 
um, completely omit the antidepressant um, 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 uh, drug and you could just rely on the lactobacillus or the bifidobacteria. That to me is more of a stretch because we're all so individual that it would need to be studied in a lot more uh, precise way to be able to conclude that that is possible. But that's the aim of the psychobiotic kind of uh, revolution. And they did a, a great book on this. Um, uh, I'm sure you know them. They are great researchers and lovely people. And uh, and the science that they produce is, is pretty amazing. But yeah, psychobiotics are really interesting, but a very complicated area, trying to pin it down to the one thing that might be behind the changes. I've read quite a lot about l ruteri as being one of yeah. the could potentially help lift mood. Absolutely, and a very interesting uh, bacterium because it's in a lot of foods that are a source of it. So you can ha you can find it in expensive supplements. You can find it in kefir, Excellent. and uh, <laughs> so you can find it in kefir that you can make yourself at home if you want to, or you, you want to buy it, you want to do a hybrid. You can buy some pots of kefir and and get a bottle of milk and put some yep. ke kefir from the shop and give it a shake and put it in your airing cupboard overnight. And the next morning you've got kefir because you've inoculated the milk with the kefir from the shop. And a lot if you took that to a to a lab, probably what you're going to find is um, an L rotary is is going to be there in substantial amounts. It's a very interesting bag that is anti-inflammatory, you know, it has largely the effect is down to um, managing inflammation. Again, when l rotary is in your gut, it may not stay in the gut for a long time. It may just be passing, which is what we know about this um, science as it continues to emerge as well, that a lot of bugs don't just stay in the gut as we thought about before as saying they find a little patch and they build a little house and they just colonize that area and that's the kind of like the lactobacillus quarter in your gut it, it doesn't quite happen like that but they could stay there maybe for a week or three days so depending on your transit time and while they are there they will produce these molecules called short chain fatty acids butyrate is one of them that has become quite trendy as well or butyric acid which is something that you find in butter uh, largely, it's a waxy kind of molecule that nourishes the, the gut lining. It fits this one cell um, um, lining that we were talking about. So those those um, um, cells in the in the gut lining called colonocytes, they feed off that butyrate that is their food. So that's very interesting. It's redeemed because I, I use a lot of it. Yeah, and it feeds your your brain supposedly so a lot of the theories that um scientists are trying to um to to test mm. are around butyrate and other of these waxy molecules short chain fatty acids doing something to the brain because they have the ability to travel via the vagus nerve as if it was a um a high speed uh um motorway into the brain and do things to reduce inflammation in the brain and again largely what they what they are postulating what they are thinking is if there is less inflammation in the brain you're less likely to have things like anxiety and depression and so on so those would cross the blood brain barrier then they, they mm -hmm. would fascinating if i wanted to have more of, of the retry if i added a capsule to my my kefir milk absolutely why not Good. yeah great yeah and you can make a, a, a personalized kefir for you. Oh, love it. Absolutely love it. What about things that we're hearing about for the, the gut? Things like extra virgin olive oil and drinking red wine with its polyphenols and omega-3s. Are, are these all shown to be impactful and helpful? Omega-3s are very interesting because they uh, are now officially... And they have been probably from about 2016, the consensus state, um, statement from a whole bunch of scientists getting together and confirming they think the same way. So this big paper from a lot of people around the world in the gut health area saying omega-3s are prebiotic. They feed your gut bacteria. So prebiotic feed your gut bacteria. Probiotic means pro-life. 
and it refers to both your own gut bacteria that may be beneficial to your own health, but also those bugs in the kefir or the kombucha that you were talking about. So they do something interesting in your body, whether they colonize your, your gut or not. And omega-3 is certainly very interesting for a number of reasons. And, uh, and if you manage to have them from a, a food, so salmon or sardines, so fresh anchovies, so even eels, which is a, an oily fish, not very popular because it has this kind of a, you know, a Victorian kind of tint to it, but again, very rich in, in uh, omega-3s, you can get more benefits. So large epidemiological studies that have looked at trends over time in very large numbers of people have actually found that the benefits from fish are not just based on the omega-3s. Um, for example, branches of big big studies like this in Greece looking at the Mediterranean diet in a typical Mediterranean country. One of the conclusions is fish is more than just the omega-3s. The proteins in the fish are doing something as well. It's that food matrix that we were talking about is delivering the omega-3s in the natural yeah. carcass that they come in. And of course, if then you want to take a supplement, great. But don't, if you can, don't rely just on the supplements. Use the supplements as it says on the team to supplement, to add, not to substitute. And certainly, yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah, just to supplement, to to add a layer of 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 uh, of of complexity and interesting stuff to your to your diet. And the other two that you mentioned, the of the olive oil and the red wine. Absolutely. Red wine, if you can tolerate drinking. I, with age, tolerate drink less than when I was in my teens. So I was a, a total party animal and I could tolerate all I wanted. And now after one glass of wine, I'm ready to go to bed. But if I had to choose what to drink, red wine has got the most uh, research benefits for your gut, your, your cognitive function, in males and females in a range of ages Mm -hmm. and in countries around the Mediterranean they recommend having a glass of wine a red wine a day things like cardiovascular uh, protection and so on and certainly olive oil is my favorite thing ever I just use so much of it it's just that I practically drink it so uh, and that's not the only reason to have it is because again if you look at the literature Mediterranean benefits uh from different nutrients olive oil is the number one they are undisputed number one amazing talking about other things that i know you love because i've been stalking you on instagram and <laughs> i gather that you've recently taken up making your own sourdough mm-hmm. how's that gone yeah interesting it's um it's uh it's a complex process, sourdough, because it's living there in front of you, and you can see it move like you know, like a monster. Uh, and that it's uh, it's actually quite uh, um, satisfying, and uh, and also talking about the the relationship between the baker and the sourdough. There's even studies talking about how the sourdough. Uh, that is made by one person is different to the sourdough that is made by another person on the basis of the relationship between the baker's hand and the microbiome on your hands and the microbiome on the actual dough. So this is beautiful because owning that that loaf when you're kneading it and you're touching it, you are part of the process. So this is feeding right into the gut brain axis. You, it's giving you the pleasure of knowing that you're going to be eating that. You're anticipating the cephalic phase of digestion, which is in the brain and is telling you to salivate because something nice is coming. And of course, when you put it in the oven and it's smelling glorious in your kitchen, because you know the bread is going to come out and you're going to feast on that olive oil and balsamic or whatever, <laughs> you know, all of that is connecting that gut brain connection. And, and, and that to me is such a beautiful thing. You own it. It's there. It's, it's surrounding you. You cannot, you cannot miss it. That is just so incredible. I love, I love that description. But for those of us who are, unable or unwilling to be making our own sourdoughs are we still going to get benefit from buying shop-bought sourdough do you think for the gut you will do and what i would say is uh don't be shy to ask even if it is a big name you know um 
talk to your customer services for a big supermarket and ask them how do they make their sourdough because they should be accountable for these kind of uh, processes. And if they tell you uh, the process involves um, fermentation for three hours, well, that is kind of like fake sourdough. It's not the proper, it is better marginally than your regular bread because you let it ferment a little bit. But what is their threshold? Are they actually letting it ferment for the full time, which should be, you know, up to 24 hours? Because that's what's going to allow you to get better digestibility, better absorption of nutrients. Your nutrients are pre-digested because your fermentation process in sourdough is slightly different way of putting bugs in your body because you're killing them when it's baked. But the benefits are from the fact that you're getting things out of the grain that would have been trapped uh, and not available to the human body thanks to the fermentation process and that also involves gluten to a certain extent and some people report it having better digestibility of gluten even if they don't have obviously celiac disease if you are celiac don't try this at home but obviously if you if you haven't got celiac disease and you tend to get a little bit bloated with bread you might benefit from eating sourdough and seeing what happens because you might find that actually your gut feels much better. Although interestingly, I have read some research that's ongoing looking at genuine sourdough and finding that it even can be tolerated by some celiacs. And obviously I'm not recommending that you try that at home, but it's very interesting to see that that, that work is, is out there and may well give us some, some good results on that. So sourdough... Yeah. I mean, my, my father, because I always have sourdough at home, which I don't make, sadly, but, but I do buy it from, from somebody who makes it properly. And, you know, he'll make himself a piece of toast in the morning and then he'll say, oh, this is great. I don't feel bloated. And that's like, wow, you know, you can see a real physical difference just in a tiny switch. That's what I love about gut health. It's often a tiny switch, adding a bit of yogurt into your diet, having a little bit of kombucha or kefir, switching your bread. And you can see real changes, can't you, in your physiology? Absolutely. But also I think, um, for me, again, the, the, the piece that we haven't discussed so much is the disco part. And disco, okay, it could be just relaxation. It could be uh, binging on Netflix. It could be anything that gets your, your creative juices going. Because when you switch off the prefrontal cortex, which is just driving that attention and the forward thinking and, and strategizing your day and, and you, uh, um, let it relax a little bit. Uh, you're regulating how the two key areas of the brain involved in emotion, uh, largely, if you simplify it, are, are talking to each other. So there's the limbic brain that is the emotional brain, the very kind of knee-jerk, stress-driven uh, brain, anxiety-driven brain, fight or flight. Uh, you, you kind of uh, tell it to chill a little bit by, you know, playing disco or dancing or watching Netflix or whatever you're doing to, to relax, reading, uh, chatting to your friends on Zoom or whatever you're doing. Uh, you're letting that prefrontal cortex um, kind of like do a little bit more. But at the same time, you don't want it to work too hard because you don't want to get too much in your own head. You don't want to analyze these things too much. So it's about the balance between the two. And whatever you do, whatever your disco is, uh, is going to have an impact on your gut as well because the communication be between the gut and the brain works both ways. And and there's more coming from the gut up because obviously there's nutrients and, and other bits and pieces that we've discussed today that will play a really big role in what goes on in the brain. But your brain is still managing the whole of the body. It's the tower of control to the rest of your body. So if you are a negotiator, one of these kind of a United Nations person who goes into a a conflict and, and, and tries to pacify things. If you, if your pacifier is disco, um, uh, watching films, reading, whatever it is, that's always going to be really good for your brain and your gut because you'll be able to say to the gut, look, you can digest easily things. You can enjoy the food that you're going, that you're going to receive without stressing about it. But it's all good. I'm sending you that reassurance messages from the top down. Digest this properly. Don't get bloated. Yeah. And it works. So that is, I mean, that is such a positive note to end on. And I hadn't really appreciated, I think, that the disco bit is actually fundamental to your work. You know, it's gut 
brain and disco and you know listening I mean I love your music I'm, I'm going to be totally dancing around my kitchen to it knowing that I'm helping my gut and my brain this is genius absolutely thank genius. you <laughs> okay, so will you come back and chat again I'd love to talk to you some more thank you for absolutely having me. yes absolutely thank you for having me bye-bye bye and that is it for today's episode. As always, you will find the links and the resources that Miguel and I mentioned over on lizellwellbeing.com, where you can also sign up for my free weekly newsletter that comes packed with my secrets to a happier gut. Huge thanks to all of you who have left us such lovely reviews. Really appreciated. And it really does help others to find the show. So thank you. And until the next time, go well. Bye-bye. The Lizelle Wellbeing Show is presented by me, Lizelle, with production by Amaryllis Earl and Harry Trevithick at Heart Dialogue, with thanks to my producer, Ellie Smith, and guest booker, Millie de la Morinière. Mm-hmm.